This video provides a brief introduction to a very popular model organism in developmental biology, the roundworm Cenorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans for short. So let me start out with a little bit of background information. Uh, C. elegans are microscopic roundworms. This one in the video clip appears a little bit flat, um, but they're actually round, and you can see that in this really beautiful scanning electron micrograph. Uh, to give you an idea of scale here, an adult animal is about a millimeter in length, but they're only about 50 microns or 1 20th of a millimeter wide. So depending on how good your eyesight is, uh, that's just barely visible to the naked eye. C. elegans are part of the phylum nematoda. Uh, the nematodes are more commonly known as the round worms. And this is a group of well over 20,000 different species found all over the world. In turn, the nematodes are grouped with several other phyla as part of the ecdysozoa, the largest group within the animal kingdom. So the ecdysozoans are characterized by having an external protective covering called a cuticle that they periodically shed. And this includes not just the nematodes, but also the arthropods, such as the other most widely studied invertebrate model organism, Drosophila. Now there are parasitic nematode species, uh, but C. elegans are free-living or non-parasitic. In the wild, uh, they live in the soil where they feed on bacteria that grow on rotting vegetable matter. So if you do any gardening, for example, and you have a compost heap, it's very likely that you have lots of C. elegans and or related nematode species uh, crawling around in there. So that's where they live in the wild, but you can also grow them very easily in the lab. I'll go into more detail on that in just a few minutes. And under those conditions, they make a really great model organism for studying uh, various aspects of both embryonic and post-embryonic development. So we'll go into some detail on that in just a bit. But before I get to that, I want to tell you uh, a really interesting story about how C. elegans was first established as a model organism. This is, in my view, uh, one of the most remarkable biologists in the history of science. Um, his name is Sidney Brenner. He was born in 1927 in South Africa. And what makes him so remarkable is that he's made uh, multiple really fundamentally important contributions uh, to biology over the course of his career across multiple different disciplines, ranging from uh, molecular biology to developmental biology to genomics. And I want to take just a minute here to highlight a few of his um, key contributions to science. So first of all, um, Brenner was one of the researchers who demonstrated the existence of messenger RNA. So if you remember uh, the central dogma of molecular biology, that says that DNA, the hereditary material, is transcribed to make messenger RNA, or mRNA for short, and then mRNA in turn is translated by the ribosome to make protein. So this is how genes are expressed, right? This is how you get from uh, the hereditary material in the form of DNA to um, biological form and function, uh, the key structural and, and functional components of cells in the form of proteins. Now this is pretty basic biology. You'll find this, of course, in um, just about any high school biology textbook that you look at. Um, so you might kind of take this for granted, but you have to remember that it took a lot of really painstaking um, and, and very clever experimentation to work all this out. So if you go back to uh, the late 1950s, at that time we knew, based on the work of Watson and Crick, um, with the help of Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, um, we knew the structure of DNA. We also knew, based on previous experiments, that DNA is the hereditary material. So we had a pretty good understanding of DNA at that time. We also knew, based on the work of classic biochemists, that proteins, as I said, are, are key structural and functional components of cells. So we had a pretty good understanding of the two endpoints here, but what wasn't clear is how you get from here to here. So how is the information um, that's stored in the, in the DNA blueprint, how does that get read and converted into uh, a biological output in the form of proteins? And so that's what Brenner helped figure out. Um, he helped to show that messenger RNA is the key intermediate here that transmits this information.
Uh, so together with his colleagues, they published this work in this really landmark uh, paper in molecular biology. This is a classic in the field that they published in 1961. Okay, so this was a really critical breakthrough. Um, but even more impressively, Brenner then went on working with Francis Crick and others to start cracking the genetic code. So at this point, um, they knew that messenger RNA was the key intermediate here, but then the, the critical question became, how is the ribosome uh, decoding the nucleotide sequence within the messenger RNA to generate the appropriate uh, corresponding amino acid sequence within uh, the polypeptide chain that's coded for uh, by that particular mRNA? So what uh, Brenner and Crick and their colleagues uh, uh, demonstrated is that the code is a non-overlapping uh, triplet code. So let's say that um, we have an mRNA sequence uh, of A, U, G, C, G, A, and so on. Um, well, this will be read three non-overlapping nucleotides at a time. So A, U, G codes for methionine. That's a start codon. Then C, G, A codes for arginine. So we'll get methionine in position number one, arginine in position number two, and so on. So that's what, um, what Brenner and Crick and their colleagues demonstrated, is that the code is a non-overlapping triplet code. And in fact, Brenner is the one who um, came up with the term codon, which is defined as three consecutive nucleotides that are coding for a given amino acid. So this was really, really impressive work, foundational work in molecular biology. The logic that they used to figure all this out was just incredibly elegant. And I think most biologists would agree that this paper is one of the all-time classics in biology. It's a really, really beautiful and well-written paper and, and a great read. Now, Brenner could certainly have chosen to hang up his lab coat at this point and call it a career. Uh, and I think by anyone's point of view, uh, it would have been considered a highly successful career at that. But he uh, wasn't done yet. He decided that he was uh, going to move on to another project. So at this point, um, he realized that there'd be more and more people getting involved in research on the central dogma, and that there would be lots of people to figure out all the details of how DNA replication and transcription and translation work at a molecular level. And so the problem that he chose to work on was um, the development of the nervous system. So how do neurons form during development and how do they all get wired together in the right way to create um, a functional nervous system? Now he uh, chose to take a model organism approach and so that meant his first order of business was deciding what model organism he was going to work with. So he gave that a lot of thought and uh, after careful consideration he decided on C. elegans. Now he chose to work with C. elegans for this project for two uh, major reasons. So first of all, C. elegans has a very simple nervous system. Uh, the adult animals have exactly 302 neurons. Furthermore, those neurons are wired together in exactly the same way from one organism to the next. And you can see that in this really nice animation of the nervous system. What you're looking at here is a map showing the positions of all 302 neurons as well as all the connections between them. The wiring diagram for the C. elegans nervous system was generated through the work of a number of individuals, including Brenner himself, uh, and Brenner was able to map the position of numerous neurons through electron microscopy. Okay, so this was key advantage number one, a uh, small and simple nervous system. Compare what I just told you about the C. elegans nervous system to, for example, the nervous system of a mouse. So a mouse uh, contains about 100 million neurons, and there's a lot of variability from animal to animal in terms of how all those neurons are connected. So you can see how, uh, if you want to understand how a nervous system is put together during development, it's going to be a lot easier to work with an, an animal like uh, C. elegans, where uh, there's a lot uh, less complexity in terms of the size and structure of the nervous system. Okay, so that's key advantage number one. The second uh, key advantage to working with C. elegans for this project is that Brenner was able to show early on that um, C. elegans is highly amenable to genetic analysis. So remember we've talked about how genetics is a key tool that developmental biologists use to study the mechanisms of development. And so Brenner wanted to exploit that approach uh, for this project. And he was able to show that he could induce uh, a variety of mutations with various different mutant phenotypes. 
including abnormal movement. So for example, here's a comparison of a wild type animal on the left and an animal with a mutation in a gene uh, that's required for neuronal function on the right. And you can see there's an obvious difference in movement between the two. So by identifying and characterizing these types of mutants, Brenner was able to start teasing apart how the nervous system uh, developed and functioned. And he published that work in yet another landmark paper. Uh, this article really laid the entire foundation for the whole C. elegans field by showing that C. elegans is highly amenable to genetic analysis. All right, so Brenner initially decides to study C. elegans because he's interested in the nervous system but it quickly becomes apparent that it's just a really great all-around model organism for studying uh, essentially all aspects of development. And so ultimately, in recognition of uh, the importance of Brenner's work in establishing the entire C. elegans field, he's awarded the uh, 2002 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, along with two other early C. elegans researchers uh, who I'll tell you about in uh, upcoming lectures. Now, Brenner went on to have uh, another important chapter in his career. He established another model organism, uh, namely the pufferfish fugu, as a model for research in genomics. Uh, but I'm not going to say anything more about that here in the interest of time. Okay, so I have a lot of admiration for Sidney Brenner, uh, given his really long list of, of impressive scientific accomplishments. But I also think he's uh, just a fascinating and uh, really charismatic individual as well. Uh, so I had the chance to go to dinner with Sidney Brenner when I was in graduate school. I did my PhD research in Geraldine Seydoux's lab at Johns Hopkins University. And the Seydoux lab studies embryonic development in C. elegans. So uh, my second year in graduate school, Dr. Brenner came to Johns Hopkins uh, to give a guest lecture. And that was already a pretty uh, exciting occasion for me to get to have a chance to hear a talk by a, a renowned scientist like Brenner, uh, who was, of course, a pioneer in the field that I was working in. So I was already pretty excited. But what was even more fun is that uh, because I was working on C. elegans at the time, I was selected as one of a handful of graduate students uh, that got to go to dinner with him after his seminar. So we all went out to a, a nice restaurant and uh, Dr. Brenner ordered a, a few bottles of, of really good wine. And uh, so we sat around drinking wine and listening to him tell us uh, some just amazing stories about his career. And not just about his research, uh, he's got a great sense of humor and so he had us all uh, practically falling out of our seats laughing with um, his stories about the practical jokes that he used to play on Watson and Crick and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So it was a really memorable meal, uh, one that I, I won't soon forget, and uh, a pretty special experience for me as a, as a young scientist. Anyway, I thought you might enjoy hearing a little bit about uh, Sidney Brenner and his work as part of this lecture. And incidentally, if you'd like to know more about him, uh, I highly recommend his autobiography, My Life in Science. In the last part of this lecture, I want to uh, tell you a little bit more about the development of C. elegans with an emphasis on some of the traits uh, that have made it such a popular model organism in the field of developmental biology. All right, so first of all, uh, it has a very simple anatomy. And you already got some sense for this when we talked about the anatomy of the nervous system. Um, but this really extends to the entire adult anatomy in general. So most uh, C. elegans adults, including the one pictured here, are what are called hermaphrodites. And hermaphrodites make both sperm and eggs. So they make both sperm and eggs and they can self-fertilize. They can reproduce without the presence of a mate. And the adult C. elegans hermaphrodite has a total of exactly 959 somatic cells. So the somatic cells are the non-germline, the non-reproductive cells. And each adult hermaphrodite has a total of exactly 959 somatic cells. So just like with the nervous system, um, that's a pretty small number of overall cells in a pretty simple anatomy, which makes it easier uh, to track where and when and how cells form during the course of development. Now, additionally, um, the adult and the embryo are both transparent. And you got some sense of that in this video clip that we looked at before. 
So this is an adult hermaphrodite here. And note that you can see right through the skin and body wall and uh, visualize the developing embryos and other structures. So this is true for the embryo as well. It's also transparent. And I'll show you that in just a second. And what that means is that you can watch cellular processes as they occur in vivo or in the living organism during the course of development. So that's a pretty useful trait. Uh, now C. elegans also has what's known as an invariant cell lineage. I'm going to do a separate lecture on the concept of cell lineage. Uh, so I'm not going to go into detail on this right now, but suffice it to say that what this means is that all of the 959 somatic cells are formed in exactly the same way from one organism to the next. In other words, uh, the specific cell types that make up the adult anatomy, those are being formed at the same time, in the same place, in a very reproducible fashion uh, from one individual to another. Now together with the simple anatomy, the, the um, small number of overall cells that make up the adult anatomy, and the transparency of the adults and the embryos, uh, that makes it really, or I should say relatively easy uh, to follow cellular uh, processes in development as they unfold. Okay, uh, C. elegans also has a short life cycle with a large brood size. Uh, that means that they generate a lot of progeny. So here's a summary of the life cycle. Uh, as I just mentioned, most adults are self-fertilizing hermaphrodites. There's also males. Uh, those are rare in the wild, but they can be maintained by crossing in the lab. So the hermaphrodites can cross-fertilize like a female uh, as well as self-fertilizing. So each hermaphrodite generates around 300 progeny over the course of about three to four days. Now the embryos begin development in utero and then they're expelled into the environment uh, through an opening in the body wall. So they complete development externally. The entire process of embryonic development uh, takes about 12 hours. So that takes us from fertilization all the way up to when the embryos hatch. And when they hatch, uh, there are small larvae called L1 larvae. Now these larvae uh, grow and then they undergo a molt where they shed uh, their cuticle. So remember the cuticle is the outer protective covering that I mentioned earlier uh, that's observed in the ectisozoa. So this process is repeated three more times and we go, uh, we go on to L2 and then L3 and L4 uh, larval stages. So all together the larval stages take about two days and then we get back to uh, a sexually mature adult hermaphrodite. Now under adverse conditions, uh, for example lack of food, uh, the animals can enter an alternative stage called the dower stage and they can survive for really long periods uh, under harsh conditions, uh, for example, again, lack of food in that kind of state. And then they can re-enter the normal life cycle once they re-encounter favorable conditions. Okay, so short life cycle of about three days and a large brood size of about 300 progeny per hermaphrodite. So these are both uh, significant advantages. Uh, in terms of a short life cycle, the obvious benefit there is that you don't have to wait very long uh, to be able to observe whatever process it is that you're studying during the course of development. So that's important. Uh, in terms of a large brood size, that's beneficial for multiple reasons. Uh, for starters, it's really useful for conducting genetic analyses. Uh, you can mutagenize and screen really large numbers of animals, so that's helpful. And then additionally, it's just nice to have a lot of animals to work with for your experiments. Um, you can just have a really large sample size, so that's always helpful. Another important consideration here when working with C. elegans is that you have a ready supply of easily accessible embryos. So uh, I told you just a second ago um, that the embryos begin development in utero, but it's pretty easy to uh, dissect the embryos out of the adult hermaphrodite. And when you do that, you can place them on a microscope slide and uh, put a cover slip over them. And then you can watch uh, embryonic development occurring under the microscope. And you can also uh, take pictures at set intervals under the microscope with a digital camera. And then if you compress all those pictures into a short time frame, you can create what's called a time-lapse movie. So here's a movie where we're watching all of embryonic development, all the way from the one cell stage 
up to the L1 larvae stage. And remember, that's about 12 hours in real time, but it's compressed into around 20 seconds here. So we'll get into the details of all the biology uh, in the next unit, but you can already see how this makes C. elegans a really nice model organism for studying embryonic development. Now remember, C. elegans in the wild lives in the soil uh, where it feeds on bacteria that grows on rotting vegetable matter. But it's also uh, really easy and inexpensive to maintain very large numbers of C. elegans in the lab. And this is another important advantage of this model organism. So this relates partly to uh, their small size and uh, rapid life cycle and large brood sizes, which we've already talked about, but also to the culture conditions that we use to maintain them in the lab. So you can take uh, a little auger plate like this, just like you'd use in microbiology, and you can spread the surface with uh, some E. coli bacteria, which C. elegans will very happily eat in the lab. And then if you let that grow for a couple of days, uh, you'll have an auger plate with a thin film of E. coli growing on the surface. And then you can use a tiny metal wire called a pick to transfer some hermaphrodites to the dish. They'll swim around in the E. coli eating it and generating lots and lots of progeny through self-fertilization. So after a few days, you'll have a plate full of hermaphrodites. So this is what they look like when viewed under a dissecting microscope as they swim around on the surface of the auger plate in the E. coli. You can see various larval stages here uh, along with some adult hermaphrodites and some embryos as well. Now once the animals have eaten all the E. coli, uh, you just transfer some of them to a new plate. And of course, if you start lots of new plates, uh, you can expand your lab population very, very quickly. The final thing I want to emphasize in terms of advantages of working with C. elegans as a model organism is that there are some really great experimental tools that have been established for studying uh, C. elegans development in the lab. Now I'm going to tell you a lot more about uh, the details of these techniques a little later in this unit, but for now I just want to uh, point out quickly a few of the key tools uh, that we use to study C. elegans. So first of all, I already mentioned that C. elegans is very amenable to genetic screens. So uh, screens like the one that Brenner did are, are really uh, great ways for studying mechanisms of development. So that's one important tool. Uh, additionally, C. elegans has a sequence genome. And in fact, uh, it was the first multicellular organism to have its genome sequenced. That happened back in 1998. Uh, and the lessons that were learned from the C. elegans genome project uh, were really beneficial uh, for the completion of the human genome project. So sequenced genome. Additionally, um, not only can you conduct uh, classic, what are called forward genetic screens, but you can also take what's called a reverse genetic approach. And with reverse genetics, you start out with a known gene, and then if you wanted to determine the phenotype of that gene, uh, you essentially turn it off. And you can do that in C. elegans using an approach called RNA interference, or RNAi for short. And this is another uh, Nobel Prize winning discovery. It's a really important uh, phenomenon and tool, and so I'll tell you a lot more about that later in this uh, unit. Okay, lastly, uh, transgenics. So you can express uh, foreign genes or transgenes pretty easily in C. elegans. For example, you could express a gene encoding a fluorescently labeled protein, and then that allows you to track the distribution of that protein in vivo in the living organism. So this embryo is expressing a fluorescent version of a protein called AJM1 that functions to hold cells together as the embryo elongates. And so with a fluorescence microscope, uh, you can follow changes in the expression or distribution of labeled proteins like this in uh, these really cool time-lapse movies. Now this adult hermaphrodite is expressing two different fluorescent proteins. One of them is tagged with green fluorescent protein and one is tagged with red fluorescent protein. So that means you can simultaneously follow the expression of both tagged proteins in the same animal. So anyway, these types of transgenic embryos and animals are really, really great tools for studying C. elegans development.
All right, in conclusion, uh, I think Sidney Brenner made a really outstanding choice when he established C. elegans as a model organism. Uh, it's a really great experimental subject for studying developmental biology. And in fact, as we look ahead to future units, uh, I'll frequently be using C. elegans as an example to illustrate the, the different developmental processes that we're going to be covering.